and recording. Um, welcome to the Chaos Community Call. Uh, I see a few people have joined us since I first posted the minutes in the chat, so I will post them one more time. If you could add your name, that would be great. I am the backup facilitator in case Elizabeth needs to take off. Uh, her daughter is in labor right now, as she just shared with those of you who were here. And um, there you go. So I'm backing up. Um, revising old metrics so that I'm just going to jump right in here. The, in the evolution working group, when I was part of this discussion, we were looking at our, our metrics and trying to decide a process for developing metrics as they evolve and under what circumstances we should put a metric back under community review when it changes. Um, we've been pretty consistent about when there is a material change to either the name or the definition of a metric that we do put it back out for community review. Um, in the case of the evolution working group, what we are thinking of doing is changing the metrics that are called code, um, code change to still include that name, but either parenthetically or in colon, a colon or in some other way, indicate that what that really is, is a commit because that's what we all call it. And so the question is, when we do something like that, we're keeping the old name, but adding a parenthetical clarification for the, for the world, um, what do we do? Um, in another, another group I was in, um, I think this was risk, there were some grammatical changes made uh, to a metric and we just accepted them and did not put it out for review because no substantial discussion I think would be had about grammar or spelling. Um, so I'm gonna shut up and throw it to the world there. What do we, what do we, do we have any thoughts on what should guide when a metric goes back under community review? I would posit anytime there's a significant taxonomy or language change that could impact other metrics or references from other metrics. Whatever there is. Can you say it again, Sophia? I, um, um, yeah. Everybody language, can take notes in the meetings too, by the way. A language or terminology change that would affect any other metric references. So it's basically what we went through with changing the changes or pull requests or. Yeah, we changed reviews to mer uh, mer merge, change requests. And because, that hold across others. So I, I'd say that that's yeah. an example. Yeah. And I and and I I think under that guide, adding some kind of parenthetical reference to the fact that a code change is in every case I'm aware of operationalized with the word commit. Um, both for more lab calls it a commit, um, Augur calls it a commit. We don't call it a code change. We may have a label, but ultimately it's a commit. It's listed. It's labeled at the, the lowest level that way um, on both pages. So it is a change though. And there and I guess in this, so I what about that case? Like is adding up that. I think adding to the name or uh, you know, alter, maybe altering the name. And like I was to, if I was to make a, a guide, I would say if we're altering the name of the metric in any way, um, that that is something we would probably put under review. Let me, let me throw that out there and see what people think. In any way, and I would say the in any way is important in this case with evolution because all we're discussing is adding a parenthetical clarification of what a code change is. And, and that would be the word commit. 
Uh, I'd like, uh, this is Lucas, hello and good morning. Good morning, um, Lucas. Um, I have an idea and that is that there would be sort of an informative and potentially retroactive notification uh, of a change so that the working group uh, could continue without having to stop, um, but the community could comment and raise a flag if there was a need. Is Kevin on the call? Chance? Yeah, I'm here. But uh, Kevin, you manage this process right now. Mm -hmm. um, does does the idea of a sort of retroactive discussion period create another path of complexity for you that you really don't want? Can you can you describe what that would what Hello, would that Ma. look like? Hello. Hello. Ma. Hello. Hi. I will Hi, um, start. Okay, video. Lucas. Uh, somebody, please. Yes. Can, can you describe what a, what a retro retroactive process would look like? Um, what I propose is that um, when you make a naming change, um, that, that you consider, you can probably look up who's, where that sound is coming from and mute. I, I, yeah, I muted. I, I looked for the person and the, yeah. the correct numbering skill was found for the mute button. Um, so let me um, start that again. So when you make a naming change, um, the community may have an interest in participating in that discussion, but um, it's important for the community um, discussion to not slow down the working group. So um, one way to approach that would be to say that you do a kind of a retroactive notification. We made this change and uh, are open to um, are open to community feedback on uh, making improvements to this naming change, for example. Um, but um, in the absence of um, suggestions and people raising a flag, we're gonna go forward with what we've done. How, how does that feel as far as a productive process that doesn't slow you down? Uh, I actually, I feel like that fits in with our existing process. Hmm. Uh, the one thing I would add to that though is a, a naming change is, uh, is could actually be a pretty drastic change for many working groups mm. in the project uh, because it it can it can affect multiple metrics that have been defined where we have referenced this this other metric. Uh, but in general, I think what you're describing fits very well with our current process. Point taken on the complexity of the interlocking uh, metrics and specifications. Uh, I guess, uh, as far as a potential reason to go through the community review again, I would actually, I would actually just add age to the the list. Uh, as a metric gets older, uh, the visualizations become out of date. The the links start to disappear. Our general understanding of that metric may have changed because we've defined other metrics that, uh, and so. Uh, I, th I think to a degree, age is a factor. Eh? So do we, it, would that be a, would we call that something different? Um, would, would that be like the second edition, the second printing of a book? It's effectively updating it, or maybe it's the paperback version. Uh, we're not changing, in that case, it sounds like we're probably not changing the taxonomic substance of the metric, but the like, for example, you use the example of visualizations. I do agree those are going to evolve routinely. And after two or so years, most visualizations look silly compared to what's available. Um, so I know we don't we don't have a ton. Of, I mean, I, I guess we do have a lot of metrics now, but we're at some point, we're going to have considerably more. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the one of the things that I've noticed is that as we've been going through, we've started to define metrics that are very similar to each other. Uh, and in those cases, we're having to establish and move boundaries, mm -hmm. uh, the boundaries of what those definitions are. Right. So when we when we start talking about, for example, the the time to response on an issue. Uh, the way we define the that time to response uh, 
could be related to the, the time to close a pull request or the uh, many other metrics, for example. So as we, as we define those, those boundaries for these metrics, they, some of the metrics boundaries kind of change. And I've noticed that the kind of the, uh, some of our, our older metrics need to be adjusted. The boundaries of those, those definitions need to be adjusted a little bit based on these, these new metrics and our better understanding of these metrics, what they are. Does, does that make sense? I probably, I don't, I don't know if I said so, that well. <laughs> so I think, so that sparks in, in my head a thought, a thought that we need something in between what we have right now, which is a very formalized approval process and uh, a Wikipedia editing war, um, it, where perhaps there's a role in, within the project for someone to garden uh, either within a working group or across working groups, these kinds of consistencies on a routine basis to, you know, if you're, if you're, and I don't know if it's within working groups, it sounds like some of the issues that you've identified are across working groups, Kevin. I think we, so we, we often catch these when we're trying to, when we're trying to define a new metric, we'll go back and look at what, what we've already done. And then we start asking the question, so how is this metric different from this other metric that we've already defined? Mm -hmm. uh, and in actually the, I think a lot of this discussion was, was due very specifically to us doing that in evolution, right? We were, we were working on new metric and, we're, and the question was, well, how is this different from this other metric? Right. Uh, and then when we go back and we look at that other metric, we realize that, well, maybe we need to change some of the language in that metric to reflect that these are two different things. Mm -hmm. uh, right. That, and I don't I know that it's a... Uh, the example you're using, I think, is from the discussion of code changes. And yeah. we're adding, we're discussing adding a metric um, called uh, pull request commits. Yeah. Um, which maybe would be pull request. But the idea of linking you know, commits to a pull request so that we get an indication of the size of a pull request. So for me, ideally, the the working group would catch that. Right. And in this case, we, if the changes are substantive enough, we can send the, the, the old metric back into review. If it's just minor language, we just make the change and we don't worry about it. However, I think we need to address that that time when we don't catch it, and I don't I don't know if that's a I don't think that's a uh, what, what what aren't we catching? I lost you a little bit there. I, I think we need to address the time when we as a working group don't there uh, is not a catch problem. that yeah. that metric has become uh, a little fuzzy compared to our other metrics, right? Yeah, I don't spend a lot of my time or any of it going back and looking at the metrics that we published, and somebody ought to do that as well. So I don't know if we want to dedicate a person to do that. Maybe it's just yeah. a matter of after, after two or three years, the metric just automatically goes into the review process one year for comments. So, so we should perhaps start releasing our metrics with sell by dates or <laughs> review by dates so that the, there's some indication of, I guess we can reverse engineer the publication date. Um, if we know, we know when every metric was last updated. Um, and there's a common structure in each of the working group repositories where released metrics are kept in a particular folder. Is that right, Kevin? I'm sorry, what was the question? There, there's, a, there's a common structure now in all the repositories where metrics that are released are kept in a specific folder. No, they're uh, not. The, I don't believe the, the structure is... Uh common across all working groups. Although I, I believe there is an effort to make that happen. Okay. Currently they are kept uh, with the focus area, like within that focus area, if a metric is released that is kept within that focus area in the working group. Uh, it, it depends on the working group, the nod. Uh, some of them, some of them uh, keep them elsewhere. Mm. So okay. yeah, may, maybe the, maybe to think of it as a, a metric being stale. Right. So mm -hmm. if, a, if a metric hasn't been 
uh, edited in two years, it's stale, and we just send it through the comment period again. Uh, right. Maybe no edits are required, but if we send it through the comment period, then people can, can take a peek at it based on what we've done over the past two years and recommend uh, edits if need be. I would propose instead of directly sending it to the comment period, like a working group should first review it and maybe assess it and then uh, yeah, put I it have down. Let the working group decide if it needs yeah. to be updated. Yeah, but it should be for the working group for a certain period of time. Maybe after two years, they should look at a release metric and review it. So I think making the... Uh making the working group uh, actually take a look at it might be just putting more work on the working group. If we send it to the, if we just send it, when it, if, it if it reaches uh, a staleness, if we just send it to put it into the review process, then the working group could look at it in the review process and comment just like everyone else, uh, Say, which, yep, would, which, which would also address what us. I, sorry, which would also address what I said earlier, where, other working groups may have metrics that are similar. And this is really what we want to catch, right? Where the, the boundary of these metrics definitions have changed because other metrics have been defined. The, um, the necessity for changes uh, introduced by um, changes in other metrics, whether they're new or modified, um, I think, um, puts the burden on the creators of the new work. In, in general, I would agree. However, because the working groups run separately, I think we have to distribute that burden a little bit. Uh, so I, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't expect the, uh, the common working group to, to completely understand what was going on in the, the evolution working group, for example. Uh, sure, we're going to look, but if we're not taking part in those discussions on a regular basis, then I don't, I don't think the burden should be completely uncommon to make sure that the boundaries of the metrics that they have created are, are different than all of the evolution metrics that have been defined. I guess my, my worry would be that the, the this process becomes too cumbersome to manage, uh, and as we get as we get more and more metrics, the 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 process is is going to get more and more complex. So uh, the kind of the laziest easiest way to do it would be to just take the metric and send it to review. Sorry, I guess somehow my sharing stopped and I'm back. So I think, I mean, I think that, I think we've got some rules that have come out of this that, um, uh, yeah, we've got some rules that have come out of this. Uh, like I think, I think name changes in any way, um, terminology changes that affect other metrics, anything beyond grammar, um, those things are going to require review. Sort of a second issue that came up is when they, you know, who is looking, who is caring for the, all these flowers that we've planted? Somebody does have to water them occasionally. And I, I think that's unresolved. Uh, I like the idea of a review by date or some systematic way of knowing the last time a version of a metric was released. Um, but sorry, I have all my dingers on. Um, 
but but I don't think we have to answer that here, Kevin. I think we should we should probably um, maybe put on the agenda for for the monthly meeting if there's a, a structure that somebody could maybe. Is, is there anybody willing to take a new item to suggest a common structure for where released metrics go in a working group repository? And if we had that, then we would be able to scan a directory in each repository that would be the same and uh, know how old the metric was or when it was last released based on the commit date in the repo. I'm right about that, correct, right, Kevin? That uh, there is, like, you know where, right now, you know where to go in every repo to pull the released metrics, but it's in your head. It's not consistent. Is that right? I'm happy to update the proposed template for the working group repositories. And the only change I see we need to do here is move the metrics not yet released or under review into a different folder. And okay. then that, that's the only change that I see. So if you, if you look at the Google doc that I shared in the chat and can put okay. in the meeting minutes as well, when I'm sharing, I, I don't see chat as easily. Here, I put, I just added it here in the minutes. Right. And I wouldn't be, I would not be opposed to, to um, I would not personally be opposed to somebody sort of just making this so um, with the consent of each working group. Uh, for the working groups that I participate in, we don't rely heavily on the repos. We only use them when we publish a metric. So. Hmm. That's a good idea to take out any metrics that are not under review or published and have those live in issues, gists, or Google Docs, and then have the repository only with the released and under review metrics. Or, yeah, or if people wanted to, there are some people who are more comfortable in Markdown, perhaps there could be a in development, metrics in development folder that would be distinct from the metrics. Uh, see that focus area, focus area name, and a directory for metrics. Maybe there could be a metric or a directory for metrics and development or something for people who prefer to work in GitHub as opposed to Google Docs. And I know there are some who do. Would that create any uh, unnecessary complexity, Georg or Kevin? It does. It adds a. It would add a step in the release process that the working groups would have to. Uh, would have to do yeah i mean the working groups i'm in have to remember to create the markdown documents uh, at release time so um, i don't know how other working groups operate i i, I gear suggestion that we just don't put metrics into the repositories until they are fully developed and that we keep them on Google Drive until then. That, that seems perfectly reasonable to me. And if there's a working group that wants to work differently, we can address that. But as long as you don't keep it under the focus area, it won't cause you any trouble, Kevin, it sounds like. Well, so that'll, that'll probably involve going through and doing some repo cleanup. Mm -hmm. to, to get sure. rid of some uh, some markdown files that uh, maybe uh, don't don't need to be there anymore. Yeah. Okay. So maybe uh, a working or a message to working group leaders about that. And I'm I'm gonna say uh, uh, Georg has. I think maybe at the monthly meeting we should uh, uh, create a 
just just have a you know put this on the agenda right off the bat for the next meeting that uh, since the next meeting I guess the next meeting won't be the monthly meeting but for the next for the monthly meeting we'll put that on the agenda to see if we can get some agreement on having working groups make their own repositories follow the structure and that would solve some of the aging problems that, that Kevin brought up in the context of this other important question. And we do now have some guidance. So Georg, will we add this kind of guidance about when it, what triggers a, a formal community review? Is, would we add that to the community handbook or is there another place that that belongs? I think the community handbook is an excellent place for this. Absolutely, yes. And we want to take the, I don't have, I've never edited it. Um, it's, if we want to grab an action item. I'm just going to put action item TBD. So if you want to, we can have a quick session, like two, uh, let's say five minutes about how to edit our handbook, because oh. that might be interesting to others as well. And it's super simple. Oh, super simple. They're like, like extremely super simple. You want me to share my screen and do a quick oh, demo? Oh, no. yeah, okay. That, sure, why not? Um, I can figure out how to stop sharing mine. Boom. Boom. Uh, do you need Here, to be okay. made co-host or are you good? I think I'm good. You should all now see the community handbook. Is that correct? I do. So Perfect. first of all, I did not know. Is that handbook chaos community slash community handbook? So. Yeah, it's handbook.chaos.community. And then you don't even need that last part. It, just it will be audited. Right? Uh, yeah. So let's say we want to go here in the community section to metrics because that's what we currently have, uh, what we are discussing. So we have the process of getting metrics approved to be visible on the website. And then we have also in here the metric contribution regular release where we describe exactly how we produce the, the website and the PDF. And so I think, what we are talking about would best fit in here. And to edit it, all you have to do is click on this little tiny, very well hidden link on the top right that says edit on GitHub. And when you click here, it opens up the markdown file in GitHub where we can go in, click the pencil. Now this is assuming you're signed in. Um, when we do this, it will now be have an editable markdown. And we can just go in and say here, where did we have this, the meeting minutes? Um, and we already agreed that we wanted to have this in the handbook. So let's say, where should we have this process of getting metrics approved, visible on the website. Um, and then we add a new section. When should a metric when should a previously released metric be returned to community review? And then we just add in here the text and we have the markdown formatting. So we just need to update. I assume the universe doesn't have these rights, though, Georg. So for many of us, we would be doing pull requests from a, a copy. Absolutely. So what will happen here, once you try to edit this at the bottom, I can directly merge this into master, or I can you, create a you new brand. You have superpowers. Yes, and for anyone else, it will tell you, you need to create a, a copy of this, but it GitHub should guide you through it on how to create that pull request at this point.
so what is the uh, uh, the preferred working group or repository or repository uh, structure for dealing with the community handbook? Should we duplicate some of this stuff or should we just link out to it? And if we're creating documentation for our working group repos or uh, do we do we want to create it in the handbook by default or or is there space to still have documentation within the uh, the, the the separate repositories? I think whenever a rule criteria or something spans working groups, then the handbook is an excellent place for that. If it is something unique to a working group, then yeah, let's keep it in the repositories. Or if it's unique to Augur or Grimoire Lab, then yeah, the repository is I think the best place for that. So I'm just gonna merge this and then now that it's merged, it will take some time for the handbook to update. I don't know how long. Oh, there it is. It was very quick. So now the handbook is updated. And that is the end of the five minute tutorial. Thank you very much, Gior. Also, just a, a reminder, this is not really related, but a reminder for the working groups that the, uh, the metric template has changed to include a header at the bottom for contributors. So when you are, when you are defining your metrics, you want to collect your contributors as well. And now it just, you do that from the commit log, Kevin, or the, the maintainer does that from the commit log? I think because we're working on the documents in Google in Google Docs oh, when we're defining oh, the metrics, right. it's probably more of an informal process. Yeah. Can we, yeah. I could use a checklist for metrics releases because I'm not sure how great I was about. I mean, I don't think the contributors in any of the working groups that published metrics this past time changed, but I didn't go look. Um, I want to get a few more minutes here. Thank you for the tutorial, Georg. I, I don't know who added World Wide Web Consortium accessibility template to the agenda, but it, uh, it might have been Elizabeth. And but I don't, does anyone else know what that discussion? Uh, that is? was yep. Yeah, Elizabeth did add that to the uh, uh, to the uh, to the agenda. So we are. Uh, there are a, a number of audits that we're wanting to do on the website. Uh, one of them is a diversity and inclusion audit. Uh, one, of them, uh, one of them is an accessibility audit. Uh, and then we're also wanting to do a marketing audit. Okay. Uh, so the we have a question from one of our Google Summer of Code contributors who would like to help out with the uh, accessibility audit. What is a marketing audit? They're not going to mess with our logo, are they? No, <laughs> no. Uh, and uh, I will let the uh, I, I would let the marketing people answer what a marketing audit is. Uh, that is not my area of expertise. Okay, yeah. uh, I think I've had one. People told me to get off of social media. But very specifically, we're talking about an accessibility audit on the website. We want to make sure right. that the that the website is uh, fully accessible. So one of the Google Summer of Code. Uh, uh, potential uh, students is wanting to uh, use the uh, this template uh, to do the accessibility edit or audit. Uh, and uh, Elizabeth uh, added it to the agenda to see what people's thoughts were on using this one, or if they had uh, other ideas so uh, or accessibility audit templates or processes that they were familiar with.
what I know about accessibility, Tim, uh, on websites is that I choose WordPress templates that say they're accessible, but I have no way of really evaluating that, or I don't know how to evaluate that. I just trust when they say that they're accessible. So we, because we do a, because we do a, a mix of WordPress and Markdown, mm -hmm. there are, there are kind of, there are a couple different ways that we can, we kind of make mistakes in, in not being accessible. Uh, like is uh, Git, I would assume, I mean, is GitHub's website is accessible? Is, is accessible? Well, <sighs> You know, I mean, Actually, you I, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so one, one, one thing that you would look at in accessibility is if, uh, uh, like, alternative text for images, for example. Hmm. Yeah, I don't either. Right. So, in, so yeah. in in Markdown, there is a way that we can we can make sure that the alternative text for for images is added, uh, and then in WordPress, there's another way that we can make sure that the alternative text for images and added is added. And oftentimes when we are creating the, the web pages or these documents, we overlook things like that. So the accessibility audit is, is designed to help us catch those things and just make the website more accessible. Okay, I mean, it sounds like a good idea. Thanks for explaining it. Because I, I, like I kind of vaguely knew what accessibility was, but and, ever actually done the work. So is there, is there, any, is there a next oh. step? So the, the, that, yeah, the, the WordPress templates themselves should be, so those should be colorblind safe, which is, which is another uh, uh, issue. And then I think you had mentioned in a prior conversation that all of the visualizations that you do for uh, uh, Augur are also using uh, colorblind safe templates yeah. so and i think vermar labs do too based on the colors that i see yeah. looking super so, similar to ours hopefully if that's not the case the the audit would catch that as well yeah. uh but the 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 fact that we have given that consideration already is it it makes me hopeful that that's not an issue for us yeah uh, and then as as far as the the w3c accessibility template goes i'm i'm perfectly comfortable with it uh and I think we can kind of, we could, uh, but I would love to hear if, if other people have been part of this process on websites or if there's uh, if other materials that would, uh, that would help the, the Google Summer of Code students uh, do this work. Okay. I, I, I don't have an opinion other than this, so the w3.org site looks valid, you know, it's like illegitimate. For you to evaluate it, and I don't have any other ideas. Um, looks like the next item is uh, Google Summer of Docs review. We are applying as a chaos organization for that. Um, and Venu, it looks like you may want to speak to that. Venu asked me to um, talk this through. You're on. Because he cannot talk um, today. Sure, no problem. We're yeah, so, to to so we are getting ready for the application deadline. We already have the ideas, three of them, for possible projects, documentation projects, uh, one in the Argo project, one for the Grimoire Lab project, and one for the just chaos community as a whole. And so, if anyone would like to help, um, we're still open to accepting help. We're still working on the application itself, which is the, the process. Google requires us to participate. We need to fill out a form. We need to submit um, a pull request, which I believe Venue already did. Um, and then we need to figure out some details around managing the budget and stuff. So and yeah, things are moving forward. And there, thank you, Venu, for managing it all. Yeah, I, I guess I would, since I put an idea on there, is there anything specific that you could assign me to help? 
I'm not aware that we need anything from you right now, Sean. All right. I mean, if, like if there's front work to be done since I asked, or since I threw a project out there, I'm willing to do the front work uh, in the service of that idea's consideration. There uh, was a... So the budget, in this case, we pay um, the budget, right? Is that how this works? It's a slightly different program. So it's different from Google Sum of Code. code. In I know that. Google Sum of Code, there is a fixed amount of money that every student gets. Here, right. the way I understand it, we scope the documentation project and then ask Google for a specific budget. And so do they, do they the question the being posted here is how much should we include in the budget? How much should we ask for? Does, does Google's, uh, I guess, if I click this link, season of docs. Um, boy, okay. Okay, so this is just, we're interested. Uh, do they provide any guidance that anyone's noticed with regards to, for example, if you have a project of that you estimated X hours or X pages or whatever the thing is, then here's a dollar figure to multiply that by. Or I, have, I don't know how to set pricing for this. You know, most of my Google Summer of Code students have been in countries with lower costs of living. And so they've been paid less than, for example, they'd be paid at a Wall Street investment bank for the summer, which is probably more than I make. Um, so how, is, do we have any guidance at all or are we just supposed to guess? I don't know. They provided a range on the website of okay. five to 15K. Okay, all right. I'm giving it some kind of proposal where we're thinking about hours, experience and location. Okay. And so when we, but when we put in the proposal, we don't necessarily know the location, right? Yeah. Um, so maybe just and, hours? Yeah. Yeah. If you can, if we can indicate hours, then uh, Google's knowledge of location can be a factor that drives budget, perhaps. Is that possible from what you recall from the application of your? And Google does pay the salary? Yeah, it sounds like it. So the way they do it is they send us the money and then we pay the writer. OK. And it can be as much as 15,000 per, per person? Is that what you were saying? Wait a minute. Is it, who gets the giant inflatable unicorn? <laughs> I mean, can we actually put that in our budget? I want, you're right, so if, I, if this is, I'm putting a giant, it's a, I want a giant for the unicorn. Uh, I believe, I thought our mascot was some sort of snake. I expect the ball for your budget. I think what we yeah. should be aware of is that we are wanting to Honestly, have yeah. three different writing uh, projects. And so we should split the 15,000 probably equally between Augur, Grimoire Lab and community. Or is it more of a situation where we may ask for 15 to support three projects, but Google may, again, with Google Summer of Code, we don't always get as many students as we ask for, although often we do. Um, and, uh, and, I think and, venue. I think venue had mentioned that we were supposed to identify. We were supposed to identify students for this as well. That this isn't necessarily a a, a competition, okay. uh, but we're supposed to identify the technical writer and say this is the person we want. Is that correct? I did not know that. The way that I understood it as well. 
is that we're finding our technical writer and we're talking with someone right now for our application as well for um, uh, SA Open. So that was our, our, our understanding too. Uh, and it was evidently kind of a big change and we were kind of changing how we're drafting it to make it more grant-like for that reason. Um, so, budgetary aspects for that too. So in three days, each project that's made a proposal would be in the position where they had to name that person or is there a period after that application when we identify the person? I think there's a period to identify them, but we already had someone. So I don't know. I'm not quotable on that. <laughs> All right, fair enough. And uh, yeah, it, it's 10 before the hour. And I, I think, um, Georg, if you need any assistance or if the projects that have already provided proposals require, our, and if you need anything from those folks, uh, you know where to find us. And um, thank you all for your time today. Uh, if you have anything that you want to add for the discussion next time, please throw it into the agenda. And um, I can just actually in the calendar. Um, thank you all very much.